Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air during this rather slow news week. Attendance holds steady at Hamvention 2018. The de-expedition team on Baker Island reports that conditions both living and on the air are brutal. AWRL Field Day 2018 participants have fun despite dicey conditions on the HF bands. World Radio Sport Team Championship, the other amateur radio summer event, is coming up. And the Canada Day Contest is coming up this weekend. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT on what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here with the latest in technology news affecting you and the Internet. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLEB, takes a look at powering your radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with a final look at amateur radio's fallen flags, the Swan Radio Company. And we will hear from Sholto Fisher, K7TMG, who works at West Mountain Radio, from his presentation at Hamvention 2018 on working HF packet and digital modes. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1009 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our descript-looking headquarters studio facility in Albany, New York, where, according to our thermometer, it hit 101 degrees today, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the western Catskills of New York State, where you hope your tired feet are fireproof, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studio, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where the temperatures this week would make a London broil feel comfortable, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. 20 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. With typical propagation no better than fair to pretty good, most AWRL field day participants nonetheless enjoyed the 2018 running of amateur radio's most popular operating event most as part of a club or group operations and some as individuals. Among them was an ARRL headquarters team that included several newer operators as well as some veterans who operated Maximum Memorial Station W1AW in Class 3F. ARRL section manager Joe Garcia, NJ1Q, said most contacts were on HF bands with a handful of VHF, UHF, FM, and SSB satellite contacts via SO50 or FO29. More than 1,600 clubs and groups registered their locations on the ARRL Field Day Locator website. Conditions were so-so on 15 and 10, but 6 meters opened for a while, and 20 and below were hopping, Garcia enthused. We were doing well on 80 meters well before sunset. He said the team's contact count would have been higher with more operators and longer operating periods. W1AW's 791 contacts yielded 1,010 points. On the West Coast, the West Valley Amateur Radio Association returned to Mora Hill above Los Altos using K6EI and W6ZZZ for the GOTA station. This year we were 14A QRP battery and solar panel powered, reported Bill France, AE6JV. The club ran three CW stations, three sideband stations, and two digital stations on HF plus VHF and UHF stations. France said go to station was quite popular, logging 50% more contacts than in 2017. Since we are next to a popular trail in the San Antonio Open Space Preserve, we get a lot of bicycle visitors, he added. Some know about ham radio and others have never heard of it. Everyone had a good time and went home tired. In Idaho, conditions didn't seem to be the best, observed Mark Earls, K7MEE, who participated in the K7BNR 6A field day operation. But we all had fun, and that's what matters. We got to try out our new-to-us mesh network. Tom Morehouse, K4AEN, and Rob Neese, KK4R, plan to renew an old tradition and take field day out on the Lafayette River in Virginia's Tidewater region in Morehouse's boat, Misadventure. The vessel had other plans, however. 
blowing an exhaust manifold and keeping the field day operations moored at the dock. After not taking part in ARRL field day for 10 years, Mark Chonard, K5YAC in Oklahoma, celebrated the recent licensing of his son Tyler, W5EAA, by assembling four stations and five operators. We worked several stations on 10, 15, and 20, but 40 and 80 were pretty noisy with storms out to the west. No records broken, but a lot of fun. A few operators braved the bands with low power operating. Those included Len Papiak, WF2V of New York, who used solar charged batteries to power his Lcraft KX2 in his barn. Phone is tough with 5 watts, but CW is excellent, he reported. He logged 195 contacts, nearly all on CW. Another QRP -er was Dale McComber, N2DM, running just 2 watts to a trap dipole for 40 and 20 meters. He said 40 was the better band from his location in central New York. For Kevin Ryan, KM6KCP, and Tom Rees, KB7XL, their Class 1B operation in Nevada was a bit of a 50th reunion. Their first joint ARRL field day operation since getting their novice licenses in high school. They managed 122 contacts, including two on satellite, Reese said in the pair's soapbox remarks. QST editor Steve Ford, WB8IMY, was among those to receive a field day message transmitted in MFSK-64 via a 100 kilowatt HF broadcast transmitter in Neun, Germany. The special transmission came during the weekly giant jukebox broadcast of the mighty KBC on 9,925 kilohertz. Field day is ham radio's open house, the message said. Every June, more than 40,000 hams throughout North America set up temporary transmitting stations in public places to demonstrate ham radio science, skill, and service to our communities and our nation. Additional reception reports are invited. ARRL field day contacts count for the International Grid Chase 2018 activity, but field day stations must upload logs to Logbook of the World, making sure that the TQSL station location includes the grid square of the operation. Field day 2018 entries must be submitted or postmarked by Tuesday, July 24th, 2018. Late entries cannot be accepted. Participants can earn 50 bonus points for using the web applet form to submit their logs. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Hamvention marked another successful year in 2018. General Chair Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ, told ARRL this week. At 28,417 visitors, Hamvention recorded its third largest attendance ever in its second year at its still new location in Xenia, Ohio. We had a slight decline in attendance, but we think people were waiting to hear about the upgrades we made, and some upgrades didn't happen until the very last moment, Kramer said. Many were worried about the mud. The drop in attendance amounted to some 900 fewer visitors from Hamvention 2017. Hamvention attendance peaked in 1993 at 33,000 before the 1996 change in date from April till May, where it was still being held at the Hara Arena. Attendance in 2016 for the show's final year at ERA was 25,364. Kramer said other events in the Xenia Dayton area cramped lodging availability, but the Dayton Amateur Radio Association organizers were very pleased with the results and comments everyone made this year. Hamvention's 2018 theme was Amateur Radio Serving the Community, and the event highlighted emergency communication forums, many put on by ARRL plus a big display of emergency communication vehicles. This was a year of fine-tuning the event through critique sessions with committee chairman and evaluating comments, compliments, and criticisms from the first-year Xenia attendees. From all the information we have received back already this year from guests and vendors, we believe we've had a successful time and are working hard to prepare for the Hamvention 2019, Kramer said. We expect new additions to the show and finer tuning to make sure our guests keep coming back. Improvements this year at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center included the use of frame tents for some activities. There was much more stable in the wind and the rain, a very big improvement, Kramer said. They installed asphalt millings in the flea market area to create roads and eliminate the mud that they had last year, and they'll be widening and adding more asphalt millings to the roads this year. In addition, Kramer said Hamvention's on-site parking eliminated some of the muddier areas and halted the use of tractor-driven people movers, which were creating ruts. They weren't immune to the rain, but they took less of a toll, Kramer added. 
Kramer also touted the more on food site options, expanding the variety and number of food vendors and cutting down on waiting times. More seating was also added. Other improvements Kramer cited included more forums, a new forum room, improved parking access by moving the bus drop-off location closer, more off-site parking with better signage, a new product showcase to highlight new products. Central State University opened its dorms for the event, offering inexpensive lodging that included breakfast and dinner. There was a shortage of rooms this year with the grand opening of the Memphis Bell exhibit at the Museum of the Air Force, Kramer explained. But the Greene County Intention Center bureaus kept tabs on the rooms and helped direct those who called. Kramer expressed his appreciation to Greene County, Xenia Township, and the city of Xenia, as well as the nearly 800 volunteers for their assistance. The Greene County Fair Board has been exceptional in making this our new home, Kramer said, and we thank all who attended this year's show and hope to see you all again next year. A team of young radio amateurs will be on the air from Market Reef Lighthouse as OJ0C from July 21st until July 28th, and again from August 18th until August 25th. The lighthouse is nearly at sea level, and waves have been known to cover the entire reef. The Finnish Lighthouse Society and the Amateur Radio League of Finland, in conjunction with ODX Foundation and DX University, have organized the first ever International Youth at Sea Cultural Exchange-Based Radio Activity, which could become a regular annual event. Baker is brutal. That was the initial assessment from the Baker Island KH1KH7Z de-expedition team, which arrived at the uninhabited South Pacific Atoll on June 26th at local sunrise, following a four-day sea voyage. The KH1KH7 team started up early on June 27th with three stations on the air, with additional stations pending. Island conditions are extremely hot and difficult. Long work periods in the sun are challenging, a June 27th The Expedition News update reported. The team reported that the landing was not too bad, but the island is an oven with temperatures well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit by mid-morning. Despite rough tidal action, the crew of the Na'i'a was able to offload all tents, generators, and emergency supplies. After the initial landing team left totally exhausted, a fresh crew arrived to put up the tents for sleeping and move radios, antennas, and generators to the storage and operating tents. They say it never rains on Baker, the de-expedition noted in its June 28th update. At midnight, giant squalls came through, knocking out one of our three antennas that we worked so hard to get up. We worked through the morning and now have six stations available. The KH1KH7 frequency plan is on the D-Expedition website. D-Expedition operators will be operating split. Do not call on the DX station's transmitting frequency. The operation is planned using the FT8 de-expedition mode. Stations should have WSJTX version 1.9.1 installed and be in hound mode. Check the appropriate box under the advanced tab in the WSJTX file settings menu. More information on de-expedition mode is available from the WSJTX development team. Plans call for the de-expedition to be very active on 60 meters. IT problems have prevented uploading logs, but the team is working to correct the issues. These will be on Club Log as soon as they are available. As part of upgrades to the ARIES program, ARRL will phase out traditional hard copy report forms later this year in favor of ARIES Connect, a new volunteer management communication and reporting system. The system, in beta testing since March in four ARRL sections with large ARIES organizations, will allow ARIES members to log information for ARRL field organization handling, but it does not change how ARIES serves partner organizations. ARIES training also is due for enhancement. The ARIES upgrade goals include aligning the ARIES organizational structure with the National Incident Management System and Incident Command System.
Emergency coordinators will continue to lead ARIES teams during an incident with support from district and section emergency coordinators. Changes would encompass additional mandatory training to include ARRL emergency communications courses and the now standard FEMA NIMS slash ICS courses. Other specialty training could include Skywarn and agency specific programs. The training levels attained would dovetail with three new levels of ARIES participation. Level 1 would be comprised of all entering the program with no training while progressing through the ARRL Emergency Communications Training and the FEMA Independent Study Courses. Level 2 would be attained upon successful completion of these courses and would be considered the standard level for ARIES participants. Level 3 would be attained upon completion of the Advanced FEMA Courses IS-300 and 400, which would qualify candidates for ARIES leadership positions. Level 1 participants would be able to fulfill most ARIES duties with a target of attaining Level 2 in one year. Level 2, the standard participant level, would permit participant access to most incident sites and emergency operations centers. Level 3 would convey full access as granted by the authority having jurisdiction plus qualifications for ARIES leadership. It's been proposed that ARRL provide a basic ARIES ID, which would convey recognition of registration with ARIES nationally and indicate level of training, but convey no guarantee of site access. The authority having jurisdiction in an incident could grant an additional ID or pass for site access. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. In about two weeks, some 62-person teams will take on the world and each other in World Radio Sport Team Championships 2018, or WRTC 2018, in the Western Wittenberg area of Germany. Held approximately every four years, WRTCs take place in conjunction with a 24-hour-long IARU-HF Championship July 14th and 15th, although the WRTC teams are subject to additional rules specific to the competition. Several years of preparation and organization began right after WRTC 2014 in New England and have led to WRTC 2018. A number of skills have been brought to play, including carpentry. A team of about 20 has been building WRTC boxes that will contain all the equipment transported to the individual sites. Everything that's needed on the site, including antenna materials, arrives packed in the box. Only the mast is transported separately, said Andreas Paul Pollock, DL5CW. This ensures that nothing gets lost in transit in vehicles. Pollock noted that the mast, antenna, tent, and generator accessories are bulky enough not to fall through the cracks, but the small items tend to disappear. Final antenna work has also been handled with 65 rotators bolted to base plates and tested to make sure they're working. Guy sets for the mast are also complete. Organizers suggest that tension's building as the July 12th date approaches. 14 North American teams are qualified, including Defending champions Daniel Craig, N6MJ, and Chris Hurlbert, KL9A, from the U.S. WRTC Chairman Doug Grant, K1DG, merited a wildcard slot, the 2018 champion said. His teammate, WRTC 2014 competitor, Director Andy Blank, N2NT, WRTC 2018, also just announced a new team leader to take the place of a competitor who had to drop out of the event. Giles Renucci, VA2EW, will head the new wildcard team of number six. He'll end the qualifications for the WRTC 2018 second place in area NA number seven, which only had one team available. Arno Polinski, DL1CW, will be his teammate. Nearly all the WRTC participants got into amateur radio as a teenager. A survey showed the average age of just over 13 when first licensed. Team leaders were chosen from each region based on two years of qualifying contest scores and have chosen a teammate for the event. Wherever they're from, the competitors must muster the stamina to sit at their radios for 24 hours straight if they want to finish on top. In Contact Sport, a narrative, author Jim George, N3BB, described the role as extreme fatigue. The final four hours are tough at every site. Describing the operators at one site, he wrote, the men who couldn't keep their eyes open, not able to concentrate, had trouble pushing the right buttons on the radio and pushing the correct keys on the keyboard. Neither of them could sit any longer. It was just too uncomfortable. 
The organizers have ensured that all competing teams will operate from a level as a playing field as possible. This includes not just typography, but antennas, and even freedom from external noise sources. A referee will be at each station to verify compliance with the rules and make decisions on any rule questions competitors may have. A real-time online scoreboard will keep spectators up to date on how the competing teams are faring. We want to make sure that all competition locations, the ongoing results at one-minute intervals are available on a scoreboard, said Bren Ben Butler, DL6RAI, who leads the real-time scoreboard team. He said special attention was given to RFI, thermal stability, and redundancy in assembling the computer systems that will collect score data. Radio DARC will cover the event with two broadcasts in English Saturday, July 14th at 1100 UTC and on Sunday, July 15th at 0900 UTC at 6070 kilohertz and on the 13,860 kilohertz band. The broadcast will explain what WRTC 2018 is and how it works and will include behind the scenes reports touching on the qualifying process. The transmitters for the Radio DARC programs are in Vienna, Austria. Fred Denon, WW4LL, and other stations in Georgia will activate AWRL headquarters station W1AW-4, the IARU contest. The AARU headquarters station will identify as NU1AW-9 with CW operations from the station of Craig Thompson, K9CT, and from the station of Jerry Rosalius, WB9Z, and Val Holtzfield, WNV9L, both in Illinois. The 2000 IARU HF World Championships run from July 14th at 1200 UTC to July 15th at 1200 UTC. These and other headquarters stations count as multipliers in calculating IARU contest scores. The Canada Day Contest takes place on Sunday, July 1st. The annual event celebrates the anniversary of Canada's Confederation. Radio Amateurs of Canada sponsors the Canada Day Contest and invites radio amateurs around the world to Canada's birthday party on the air. This event begins on July 1st at midnight UTC, that's Saturday, June 30th in North American time zones, and continues until 2359 UTC. The available bands are 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, and 2 meters on CW and phone. Suggested frequencies for CW are 25 kilohertz up from the band edge. Look for sideband activity centered on 1.8508, and 28.5 megahertz. Stations in Canada should send their signal report and province or territory. VE zeros and stations outside Canada should send the signal report and serial number. Contacts with RAC official stations, which have the RAC suffix, are worth 20 points. A trophy is awarded for the highest single operator with no power classification, non-Canada participant. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, June 29th. Well, as the saying goes, nothing good lasts forever. Last week's spotty sun has now gone utterly spotless. As a result, the solar flux index has edged down somewhat to about 70. This is going to make it that much harder to work the Baker Island D expedition. Your best chances may occur on 80, 60, or 40 meters late at night or in the wee hours of the morning local time. Geomagnetic conditions are forecast to be reasonably stable most of the time, and that'll help somewhat. On VHF and UHF, there is tropoducting reported on 2 meters and up in a zone that stretches from roughly South Dakota east to Pennsylvania. Folks in South Texas are reporting substantial openings as well. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I felt, I don't know, what are you, how, how are you feeling these days? I feel... Now, I'm in an unusual situation because I overshare already. I'm on the air talking to people five days a week, 
four days a week. So by the time I get home, I feel like anything that anybody wants to know about me is already out there. So I don't use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social networks like that, probably in the way a normal person would to let people know what I'm up to and to promote stuff. Uh, it just, uh, I don't, I don't feel the need. It's the same reason I got my ham license, you know, my amateur radio license. I was very excited. I really enjoyed it. Took the test, got the, the general license and got all the equipment and stuff. And then I never use it because I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm already talking to people <laughs> for my work all day, every day. And the last thing I want to do, I know there are people, I know Art Bell, Art Bell, he'll do his, he used to do his radio show, get off the air and then go on uh, and, and, and talk to hams for two more hours. I just want to go home and watch TV. <laughs> I just want to shut up. And nowadays, when I, when you're talking about computers, you're talking about probably not talking about a mainframe computer. Are they they still exist? Those those big old computers, you know, that take up a, a size of a room that banks still use them. Still somewhat <laughs> still used around the world. Uh, nor really are we these days talking about the the desktop behemoths, the towers, although more than a few of us still have towers lurking here and there. Maybe we're talking about laptops or tablets, but the most prevalent computer by, I think it's almost an order of magnitude, an extra zero, is the smartphone. Apple claims to have a billion active iPhones or iOS devices, mostly iPhones, a bit one billion. And that's just Apple. There's probably uh, three billion or four billion out there. It's a huge number, and they're every they're ubiquitous in the sense that they're always in your pocket. They're wherever you are. Nowadays, you can't go to a restaurant without seeing a family sitting around the table, all staring at their their little five inch screens. They're not talking to each other. They're looking at. What's strange is uh, we're still talking, but we're just not talking to each other. We're talking to. You know, our our friends on Snapchat are looking at pictures on Instagram or seeing what uh, Aunt Myrtle's up to on Facebook. It's as if the people who aren't with us are more important than the people who are with us. Strange. It's a strange phenomenon. And I think it has something to do with the fact that the people we're with, you know, aren't quite as vivid and colorful as the images on the screen, are they? They're not quite as stimulating. They're not quite as attractive and engaging and that's not a, that's not an accident. That's actually uh, exactly how it is designed on these on these phones. It's designed to grab our little monkey minds to to look and and feel and it would smell and taste if it could like something incredibly fascinating because well of computers. <laughs> it does go back to computers because the people who design Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and well, really, could stop at Facebook. The people who designed these tools, they're not evil. They're not bad people. But they understand that the you know their business, their job is to get us to spend more time, more screen time. They call it engagement, attention, attention on what we're on what you know their stuff, their product. They're they're designed to maximize that, and that's that turns out to be a fairly easy thing to do. Often in in technology, the thing that is easiest to do is most likely to get done. One of the reasons in computer games, for instance, that we shoot things, <laughs> that it's all about shooting things, uh, is because in the earliest hardware, which had very, you know, significant limitations in terms of amount of memory and processor speed and all that, one thing they could do very well is something called collision detection. One thing hitting another. They had that built into hardware in the early Commodores and Ataris. That was an easy thing to do didn't take up a lot of memory or programming time. So programmers did it. In fact, you may, may remember the, the earliest computer games, Pong, right? A paddle and a ball, the ball striking the paddle. Boom, 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 boom. That was an easy thing to do. Then there was breakout. And as the time went by, it turned out, hey, you know what? You could also use this to shoot things. <laughs> and then Duck Hunt and then Doom and Quake. And those turned out to be horrifically successful. The initial feedback loop, though, to this was uh, was e-commerce, was the market. Oh, we sold a lot of that. Let's do more of those. But that's slow. That takes time. You know, way a year later, you go, oh, we should make that movie again. It turned out pretty well. In a way, that kind of taking time was a good thing because it slowed down. It's taken uh, over time. We've, we've gotten better at making engaging games, engaging movies and books and 
TV shows because we've got that feedback loop. But it's slow. It was a slow loop. It took us, uh, you know, a decade or two or three to figure out that what really people wanted to watch was a bunch of people fighting and falling in love in a house, which I think is like all TV shows. It took us a while. To <laughs> oh, they tried it with I Love Lucy. It worked. And the and then the honeymooners that worked. Hey, maybe, but that uh, that feedback loop is a lot faster now, right? Facebook knows exactly how much time you spend on Facebook, and more importantly, what you look at, and how much time you spend looking at each article. So it's a trivial, it's an easy thing to do. And again, remember, computers we tend to do the things that are easiest first. Easy thing to do to measure that, and then optimize for it. That's a word computer scientists love. We're going to optimize for this. That means we're going to. We're going to do what we need to do to make that engagement time that longer, that amount of time you spend looking at it longer. And that means they don't really need to guess, really, what's attractive. They just do something. And this is another thing that the, the modern uh, computer scientist loves. A, it's something called A-B testing. And it's being done to us all the time. You don't know it. In the, uh, the, the first early examples of A-B testing were a magazine that would try two different covers or three or four and see which one sells the best. Again, takes a while. You got to wait. Got to get the sales figures. Okay. Hmm. They like that picture better than that picture. We should put more of that picture on our covers. Well, now it is, you know, it's instantaneous. The data gathering is multidimensional. They know all sorts of stuff. Where you, where you, <laughs> they don't know where your eyes are yet, although they do do eye tracking studies, but they can't tell that about everybody. But they can certainly tell where your mouse is, where your finger is, where you touch, and they can optimize for that. And they do A B testing. Does this, in fact, uh, we, we learned uh, in interviews with political campaigns, particularly with the Trump campaign, that they would try different colors on the ads to see which ones got the best response. And in terms of response, it's easy to measure. How long do you spend on that page? Whether you shared it, whether you liked it, you know, we, we're complicit in this because we love it. We love clicking the like button, right? The thumbs up button, sharing it with friends. <laughs> we're, giving, we're giving them all the information they need to say, hmm, they like purple. It's often said that Facebook is blue, that's its predominant color, because Mark Zuckerberg is uh, colorblind. But don't kid yourself, Mark doesn't need to know what color Facebook is. He doesn't even, from, from his point of view, it's probably pound sign CCF302. That's a, that's a color in, in web jargon. <laughs> uh, because he's tried CC. F301, and that didn't work as well as 02, but 03 was maybe a little bit better, and they keep doing it until they get just the right color to keep your eyeballs on that, glued on that page as long as possible. So that feedback loop is instantaneous, can be modified rapidly, easily, and uh, in an ongoing way to make it more and more attractive. So it's really no accident. It's not our fault that we spend this much time looking at the screen instead of those boring people like your family sitting across from you at the table. Because the screen is a vast psychological experiment on every minute of the time you're using it. It's an experiment on you to see what you, what your monkey mind, our monkey minds is most interested in. And then optimizing for that. Because after all, that's profit. And profit is good. So I wish I could do that in radio. We don't have that feedback loop. Magazines, books, TV shows. The feedback loop is slower. It's pretty fast now on TV because they've got people meters and stuff. But it's still slower than Facebook. It's easy, instantaneous, and constant. And after now 10 years of doing that, mm, boom, 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 boom. They really know how to get you. They know what you want. It's good for us to be aware of it. If we're going to be a, a, you know, a guinea pigs, it's good for us to know. I mean, doesn't mean we're not guinea pigs anymore, but it's good for you to know. <laughs> you to know. And maybe you could you know, consider that and maybe try to break the loop, the cycle somehow. Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? You know, Microsoft does something that I, I really applaud, I commend. They do uh, big public beta testing. Apple's doing it now, too, because it's such a good idea, where they, where they say, look, uh, if you want to get the latest version, the new version of Windows before everybody else does, Microsoft says, join the insider ring. You can be a Windows insider. And you can see it. Now, I think Microsoft needs to do a little bit of a better job explaining what the responsibilities of an insider are. Historically, bug testing, sometimes they call it beta testing because the, the beta version of a product is a pre-release version. 
Historically, if you're a bug tester, a beta tester of software, you actually have a job. It's not just, oh, cool, I get to see the new stuff before anybody else does. And that's kind of what the insider program implies. Really, as a beta tester, your responsibility is to try to find bugs because there are bugs. There are problems. And and it, your job is to, to not only figure them out or to make them surface, but to keep a careful record of what caused it and then, most importantly, report it. Apple does the same thing. They actually, when you install a public beta of the new operating system, whether it's iOS or Mac OS, they install a feedback program and they put an icon right there on the desktop for the feedback program to remind you that part of your job as a pre-release tester is to, f is to not only find bugs, but to report them. And I'm, I'm feeling like even though Microsoft literally has millions of people pre-release testing these versions of Windows, they're not getting the information back they need. Very famously, a couple of updates ago, the Windows update they pushed out, you know, one of the big feature updates, broke the camera on many computers, including Microsoft's own. You know, the, the video cameras built in that made them not work. And then it, uh, it, if you had a Kindle and you plugged it into your Windows machine, it crashed the whole machine just by plugging it in. That, that sh those two sh things, at least the camera thing, should have been found and reported, and Microsoft should have known about it before they shipped it. For some, somehow they didn't. Last couple of updates have been pretty clean, but this one, 1803, the one that's going out now, and if you don't have it yet, you're on Windows 10, you will have it because uh, it is now uh, gone, what they say, go, call it gone wide. It's everybody's getting it. It's being pushed to everybody, uh, and I think prematurely. And I think that there are kind of significant problems that people, including one of the things people are seeing, uh, blue screens uh, of death crashes during the install, which is very scary. That can mean sometimes that the install trashes your system. You know, a blue screen during the install can leave your system in a very precarious state. So those these are not good. These are significant flaws. Microsoft to this day does not acknowledge them, but people who are covering Windows say it's it's surprisingly widespread. Unfortunately, the way it works now with Windows 10, remember we all got that for free, you know, the free upgrade from Windows 7. Part of the deal was you have to do updates. You cannot refuse updates. You can defer them. And how long you can defer them will depend on which version of Windows you have. There's a sneaky trick, though. And if you don't have 1803 yet and you're not in a hurry to get Timeline or one of, one of the other kind of mind, there's some cosmetic updates as well. If you're not in a hurry, which probably you're not, one of the ways to defer it is to say that you're on a metered connection. This is a really silly workaround. But if you tell, you open your network settings and you say, this is a metered connection. In other words, they, I pay for the bandwidth. Most of us have unlimited bandwidth. But lie. Say, I pay for the bandwidth. Microsoft will then not download the update and automatically apply it. I don't know how long that will work for. Quite reasonably, Microsoft wants everybody to update because uh, that keeps the ecosystem healthy. You know, fixes significant flaws that could cause problems in the Windows world which could cause problems in the world at large. So they want it, they want that fixed. So update if you if update if you can. If you're worried or you just, you know, you you're not sure, you can say defer the update or say I have a metered connection in your network settings and that'll put it off. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are this week in amateur radio. Your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air available online at www.twiar.net. In the winter of 1960-1961, Herb Johnson, W7GRA, began producing single-band, sideband transceivers in a garage in Benson, Arizona. At that time, the only other SSB transceiver on the market was the Collins KWM2. W7GRA's company, the Swan Electronics Corporation, would provide strong competition for Collins and a low-cost method for hams to get on sideband. The first Swan transceiver, the SW120, was marketed in January 1962. It was a 130-watt PEP single-band unit operating on 20 meters. For die-hard AM operators, the SW120 could put out 25 watts of amplitude modulation. It featured 15 tubes and a price of $275. In the summer of 1962, a 40-meter version, the SW140, came out at the same price. These units were followed by the SW175 for 75 meters, 
the 160X for 160 meters, and the SW240, a tri-band transceiver for 75, 40, and 20 meters. In 1965, the Swan 250 was introduced. This was a 6-meter transceiver featuring 240 watts PEP, 180 watts on CW, and 75 watts on AM. The price was $325. An updated version, the Swan 250C, came out in 1968. The 250C was priced at $420 and featured selectable upper sideband, lower sideband operation, an S meter, a built in 250 kilocycle crystal calibrator, and improved frequency readout. The 250 and the 250C proved to be very popular with the 6 meter crowd. They were only a few dollars more than Heathkit's 6 meter rig, the SB110, but unlike the Heathkit, they came fully assembled and featured AM operation. Swan had, of course, long outgrown that Arizona garage, and Herb Johnson had relocated the company to Oceanside, California in the early 60s. In 1967, Swan was acquired by and became a wholly owned subsidiary of Cubic Corporation in San Diego, California. Herb Johnson stayed on with the company. New radios introduced after Cubic's purchase included the Swan 260, the 270, the 300B, the 350, the 400, the 500, the 700, and the 750, all five band HF rigs. Swan also produced a set of twins, the 600T transmitter and the 600R receiver. In the early 1970s, Swan entered the new VHF FM market with a 12-channel crystal-controlled 2-meter rig. Swan faced stiff competition in the VHF FM field from the Japanese rigs and soon left that market segment. By 1973, Herb Johnson felt that it was time to move on, and he left Swan. He formed a new company, Atlas, and began producing two very popular units, the Atlas 210, covering 80 through 10 meters, and the Atlas 215 for 160 through 15 meters. The Atlas transceivers proved to be durable, affordable, and reliable. Unfortunately, by the end of the 70s, the Japanese HF rigs had cut into the sales figures and profit margins of both Swan and Atlas. And so, Atlas ceased production, although the corporation still existed. As for Swan, the parent company, Cubic, decided that the corporate emphasis should be on high-tech military and business electronics. And so, they retired the Swan name after producing over 82,000 transceivers. Cubic continues in operation to this day, producing location equipment for the oceanographic community, radio direction finding equipment in support of search and rescue, law enforcement and surveillance applications, and a line of HF transceivers for the aviation industry. Unlike Hammerland, Halicrafters, or National, Swan Cubic Corporation did not have to suffer the embarrassment of a bankruptcy or of going out of business. Instead, Cubic merely evolved and moved on in another direction. Although the Swan name is dormant and Cubic no longer produces ham equipment, there's always that possibility they may come back. As for Atlas, many hams wish that they had stayed away. In the early 90s, Atlas returned to the amateur market with a new HF transceiver. Unfortunately, this radio was plagued with production and quality control problems. Many hams put down a deposit and never got a radio. A few did receive the new Atlas and were disappointed. The resurrected company called it quits after only a few months. Maybe it's true, you can't go home again. In our next installment, we will continue to look at the fallen flags of amateur radio. Until then, this is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio A question that occurs more often than you might think is one related to powering your radio. It comes in a few different flavors, like I want to install a radio in my car, how do I power it? Or 
I want to operate portable. What's the best way to power my radio? Or what power supply should I buy? There are many more versions of this, but they all come down to the same underlying challenge. I spoke about sizing a battery a couple of years ago, but that's not the only consideration. If you look at the power specifications of my Yaesu FT857D, you'll see 13.8 volt DC plus or minus 15%, negative ground, 1 amp on receive and 22 amp on transmit. Based on this, I purchased two 26 amp hour batteries and a 45 amp variable power supply. My amateur license restricts me to 10 watt, and I tend to operate using 5 watt. On receive, the actual draw specified in the documentation at 1 amp doesn't go above half an amp in typical use. Transmit, specified at 22 amp, doesn't go above 3.6 amp at 5 watts, and at 10 watts it's still only 4.5 amp, so my 45 amp power supply is slightly overkill by a factor of 10. By the way, that's an FM carrier on 2 meters. Different modes and bands have different current draw. I should make mention of the duty cycle, that is the difference in time spent transmitting and receiving. 100% duty cycle means that you're transmitting all the time. 50% means half the time and 25% means that for every minute of transmission, you'll spend three minutes listening. There's more to the duty cycle. In brief, AM, FM and RITI are 100% duty cycle modes. CW is a 40% mode and SSB is a duty cycle of 20%. So if you're listening half the time on SSB, your duty cycle is only 10%. At this point, you should at least understand that what the manufacturer says on the box and what your radio actually does is entirely dependent on your use case. I have no doubt that there is a way that I can operate my radio so it draws 22 amp. I'm not quite sure how, but I'm sure it's possible. Sizing aside, there are other things you need to consider. If you're in a car, do you wire the contraption directly to your car battery or to a secondary battery? Should it be connected directly or via the accessory switch? Should you get a DC to DC power supply or some other technology? Also, not all cars are 12 volts. Not all cars have their body as earth, and the thicker the wire between the battery and the radio, the better. My decision, given that I live in a country where distances are non-trivial, and in a state bigger than Texas, in fact, Western Australia is bigger than Alaska, Texas and Minnesota combined, I decided that it would be prudent to make the power supply for my radio completely separate from my car. I have a toolbox in the boot, that's the trunk if your regulator is the FCC, which contains two 26 amp hour batteries. I take it out to charge and put it back when I need it. Other solutions include second batteries with disconnect on low charge circuits, manual and automatic ones, direct connect to the main battery and variations on that theme. In shacks I've seen batteries which are constantly charged connected to a radio and dedicated power supplies bordering on being a local substation to ensure that enough of the good stuff makes it into the radio and out to the antenna. For portable operation I've seen lithium in several different flavors, car start boost batteries, mobile phone USB batteries, remote control car batteries and the like. If you have more than one, bring some red Velcro and use it to mark the flat battery. One of the things you'll really only be able to learn after doing it is finding out what the noise level is that a power supply generates. A battery generally doesn't make noise, but the charger or up converter might. Inverters are often a great source of HF noise, the cheaper the more noise, so test before you buy. Also, none of what I've said so far considers emergency preparedness, which is a whole other topic for another day. As in any technical situation, in theory, practice and theory are the same. In practice, they're not. Be prepared to do some real-world tests, see what your friends are doing, and see what you can take away from that. My purchase of a laboratory variable 45 amp power supply was excessive, but it's likely to outlast me. The two 26 amp hour sealed lead acid batteries are very heavy, but I avoid carrying them as much as I can, and so far, seven years later, they still last most of the weekend during a contest. There's not a one-stop solution for power, just like there isn't one for picking a radio. How do you power your radio? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, were you active on Packet back in the 1980s or 90s? I'm probably one of the relative few who can say I was an administrative sysop 
on VHF UHF packet in Chicago, back then on what we called in those years a packet bulletin board. One ham who remains active on HF packet here in 2018 is this guy. My name is Sholto, Sholto Fisher. I'm K7TMG and I work at West Mountain Radio. I'm also licensed in the United Kingdom and my call sign is G7TMG. So it was made it kind of easy just to have the two calls similar. I've been doing digital modes really since the late 1980s when I was a kid. So I've seen a lot of things change, come and go. And one of the things that stuck with me was high frequency packet. Even though it fell out of favor in the 90s, especially when the internet came along, I think there's still a lot of utility in it and I'm gonna talk to you about that today. The world of amateur radio digital modes has changed a lot over the last 30 years. We've seen distinct periods of innovation and rapid uptake, only to find several years later, many of these new modes have disappeared into obscurity. Modes such as Amtor, Clover, and GTOR were very popular in the 1990s, but now you'd be very hard pressed to ever hear them on the bands. Even fairly recent modes such as PSK31 and MFSK16 have diminished due to the popularity of the somewhat loosely termed weak signal modes like JT65 and FT8. This trend for rapid contacts, often computer automated with very limited QSO exchange, is extremely popular with many amateurs today. I personally think this is a bit unfortunate for a number of reasons, not least of which are the minimal skills needed to do it. There is little to learn or improve upon, and while this may suit those who desire instant gratification, much is lost in the social realm when the computer makes all the decisions for you. I'm not here to tell you to stop using JT65 or FT8. I simply want to spread the message that there are other forms of digital amateur radio, which when you've had enough of the rapid fire modes, you might find you enjoy. I've been involved with HF packet radio for many years, and I'd like to tell you about how it works from a practical point of view and to state clearly for the record that it certainly isn't a dead mode. In the US, we are extremely fortunate that a group of amateurs back in the 1980s conceived, built, and continue to maintain a high frequency packet radio network on the 20 meter band. Network 105 has been in continuous operation since June of 1986. It was founded by Bert Amaro, Victor Echo 1 AMA, for the purposes of social interaction and technical improvement. In many ways, it really was the first Wi-Fi social media. Bert passed away in 2010, but his network survives. But it nearly didn't. The network is composed of individual stations and is always evolving over time. People come and go only to return a few months or even years later. For a while it was plain to many of us, a rapid uptake of the internet caused activity on network 105 to decrease. During these years there were just a few holdout stations that kept things going. It seemed that the network may disappear into history. But this trend turned around after 9-11, and I'm not exactly sure of the motivation, but after those terrible events of September 2001, we saw a marked increase of network activity, and it's been growing ever since. We've also recently seen amateurs joining us who are concerned with net neutrality, and while Network 105 is certainly never going to be a replacement for the internet, it does provide a level playing field for all stations. It would be totally wrong to consider the network as a replacement for the internet. The limited bandwidth and speed of packet radio, plus the vagaries of HF propagation, rule this out. However, there is one unique aspect which keeps us there. The network requires no infrastructure other than your own HF transceiver, a computer, and antenna to operate. 
There's something almost magical about being part of a large social network unencumbered by internet or cable fees or regulations. It is not elitist in any sense, and all are welcome. The only price of admission is a little technical knowledge to get started and a desire to learn as you go. So let's take a look at some current activity. Uh, this map I created by observing the network for about two days. The stations which form the network are marked by a blue circle. The little colored blocks represent two or more stations geographically close to each other. There are definite clusters of activity where packet radio is popular. From monitoring, it's clear that Colorado seems to have the greatest density of stations. Each of these stations form part of the HF network. They may simply be a single amateur running no more than a chat terminal, or it may be a BBS station, i.e. a store and forward bulletin board system. Or they could be what's called a node, which is a special type of station which allows packet switching, often providing a gateway to other geographical areas or onto other bands. Quite often, a single station will run all of these services simultaneously. Currently, the extent of the HF network reaches the entirety of the US, parts of Canada, Ireland, Puerto Rico, and Costa Rica. There are also numerous VHF stations which form part of the network too because they are in range of an HF node station. But the VHF stations are not shown on this map because they're too numerous. Every day stations come and go as people join or leave the network, so it's constantly changing size and coverage. So let's briefly explore the types of stations you can encounter on the network and understand how you can tell which station is which. Each station periodically sends out a beacon which usually indicates the functions or services provided by that station. The method used to distinguish different services provided is by use of the SSID, the secondary station identifier. The FCC allows us to append an SSID to our call sign. We use it to differentiate different functions our station is capable of. It is a number between 0 and 15 added to the base call sign. The de facto standard for the network is as follows. When there's no SSID or dash 0, that means you can connect to the base call sign. The intention is to chat with the station operator. Um, it is also commonly the Digipeter SSID. When you see an SSID of dash 1, it indicates that a personal mailbox or BBS is active on that station. An SSID of 2 is not used much but it indicates what's known as a cross-port digipeter. Usually this is implemented by just certain TNCs like Cantronics. An SSID of seven is probably the one most useful for most people, and that means that a node is operating at the station. It can simultaneously function as a cross-port digipeter for AEA and TimeWave TNCs like the CAM Plus or the software TNC BPQ32. An SSID of 10 is actually discouraged on the network for regular use because it indicates there is a WinLink gateway operating which can be used to send and receive email to the WinLink 2000 system and the internet. But it would only really be used in an emergency if it was necessary. An SSID of dash 11 usually signifies that a multi-user chat server is operating. Occasionally you'll run into stations with different SSIDs than listed here, but that's usually because the station forms part of another network and it would be awkward for them to actually change their existing SSIDs. Although this is a pretty good rule of thumb, occasionally you will see differences. Most stations do conform to the standard, uh, so you can usually have a good guess, even if you haven't seen the station's beacon just by knowing what SSIDs are there. We should try and talk a little bit more about what makes 
packet unique and what digipeters are and that type of thing if you've never come in contact with them before. But the simplest form of a packet network is a digipeter network. As its name suggests, it operates in a similar manner to a regular voice repeater. Because of HF propagation, station A cannot hear station C. Station B can hear both, so it's in an ideal location to act as a bridge between both stations A and C. A digipeter is a very basic packet repeater. When it decodes a packet destined for another station, which includes some information to indicate that it should be digipeated, it will transmit the same packet to the other station. The information to indicate a packet should be repeated is called the path. It can include one or more station call signs to act as digipeters. In this example, I'm sending a packet with the text hello world to EI2GYB in Ireland. I specified a, a digipeter path of KB9PVH and VE1JOT. When KB9PVH decodes my packet, retransmission occurs and the packet slightly altered to indicate it has been digipeted. When VE1JOT decodes the packet, it recognizes that it should also retransmit the packet. If EY2GIB decodes the packet, he understands the path back to me is via VE1JOT and KB9PVH. So that's very simply how a digipeter works. And I'm going to now tell you about a node because we no, really, no longer really use digipeating. The problem with the digipeated network is it just doesn't work very well on HF. There's too much chance that one of the stations in the digipeated path won't decode the packet. The other problem are retries and acknowledgements must be handled end to end, i.e. they traverse every station in the digipeated path. A better solution was needed and this is called the node. In some ways, similar to a digipeter, the node allows two stations who can't hear each other to connect. Unlike a digipeter, the node has a memory buffer and accepts multiple packets for the connected stations. Acknowledgements and retries are done by the node rather than end-to-end -end like the digipeter. This is much more reliable and efficient on HF. It's possible to connect to multiple nodes in turn and so in this way create a network and have the ability to travel along it. When you connect to a node, your own SSID will decrease by one automatically and the node will use your call sign and this new SSID to make outgoing connects. This is to prevent the wrong station from replying or the, the wrong SSID. There are only 15 SSIDs available. Your SSID at the first node will become minus 15 because your SSID when connecting was zero and it wraps around to minus 15. If you connect to another node, then it will become minus 14 and so on. In the example case, 7TMG is connected to W1ABC through two different nodes. If K7TMG sends data to W1ABC, the retries and acknowledgements are done between each of the neighboring stations and the data travels along the network until it can be delivered to W1ABC without error. Remember that packet radio is time division multiple access, so many stations can be on frequency at the same time and each has a time slot when it can transmit. Now, I'm not going to delve any deeper into the nuts and bolts of, of packet radio AX25 networks. As long as you've got a basic understanding of digipeating and nodes, you really have all the skills necessary to use the network successfully. So, enough of the theory, how do we use the network? In order to operate HF packet radio, you're going to need some form of modem. This can be a hardware TMC, like the, the old-fashioned PK-232s or the CAM Plus, or you can use a modern software program, such as UC7HO's sound modem. 
Even some multi-mode digital programs like Multi-PSK and MixW have a packet radio mode available. If you have a modern, fast Windows PC, then I'd recommend the software modem because it easily outperforms the decoding ability of the old hardware modems. I think it's also easier to configure and understand, especially for those just getting their feet wet with packet radio. There are some advantages to the older modems, however. They can be left on when the computer is turned off. They can be used on ancient computers. That old PC in the back of the shack could be used again. Also, many of them contain firmware which enables you to make your own node and set up your own personal mailbox. Nodes can be configured to work with the software modem too, but it's harder to implement as they require complex configuration. We'll look at some of the important network parameters. There's just a few parameters to remember, and these have been selected over the years for maximum efficiency. First, make sure you're on the correct frequency. What you set the dial on your radio to will depend what type of modem you're using. Cantronics modems uses tones at 1600 Hz and 1800 Hz, but the PK232 has tones at 2210 and 2310 Hz, so this accounts for the different dial frequencies. The software modem introduces much greater variability, as its waterfall cursors can be placed anywhere within the audio passband. In practice, it will be fairly easy to tune the software modem as you'll be able to see each packet on the waterfall and place your cursors appropriately. Once you're satisfied with the tuning, you'll want to make sure your modem is configured correctly with the network parameters. And as I said, there's only really a few critical ones. You have one called PacLen, which is the packet length or size in bytes. Max frame, which is the maximum number of frames to send at once. We discovered on HF that trying to send more than one frame at a time is pointless. So that's why we say use a max frame of one. The FRAC is a timer. It's the frame acknowledgement time and it actually indicates the length of time you'd wait for an acknowledgement from another station. D-weight is a delay for digipeated packets. It doesn't really matter, but you specify zero for that. There's no, because there's very little latency on HF, there's no need to have a delay there. And then the actual board rate we use on air. For HF, we use 300 board. The fastest speed we can use under the current FCC regulations with this type of modulation. And that concludes a fairly lengthy look at high frequency packet radio then and now with Sholto Fisher, K7TMG a longtime high-frequency packet enthusiast and employee with West Mountain Radio today. Now for you old-time packeteers, I'm Larry McGlore, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower, so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. 
If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur size coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to five inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all around the world and all across North America on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, where you can hear This Week in Amateur Radio every Saturday night at 9 p.m. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.